Welcome to another message on systematic theology. I hope you've enjoyed this. This is number 10, I believe. Mm -hmm. And we have studied general revelation. We've studied particular revelation. General revelation uh, concerning the person of God is that God, through nature and through his creation, establishes the fact that he is there. You understand that? That, that through the natural world, everyone ought to be able to see that God is there. And he's a God who cares. He didn't just create this world. He cares about it. We're on page 60 in uh, Thiessen's Lectures in Systematic Theology. We're reading from this, using this as our textbook, and doing quite a little bit of commentary on it. We studied that God proves himself to mankind because every person has the intuitiveness, the internal wiring that God is there. God is there. The ontological argument, as commonly stated, this argument finds in the very idea of God, the idea of God. Why do people have an idea about God? I've said this in the past many times, uh, invent a God that they can deal with, that doesn't bother them, that they have no responsibilities to, and that's the God that they worship. If you look out that window here, right up there, you'll see a 14,000 foot mountain range. You'll see, if you went up there and inspected that, you would find the largest line, large full pine trees in the world are up on that mountain. The oldest trees in the world are on that mountain. There are trees on that mountain that go back to the time of Abraham all the way back to the time of Adam. Those trees go all the way back to that period of time. I have gone up there and I, I've looked at the oldest trees in the world. There's the Patriarch Grove up there. And they used to have a building up there on there. They said, Noah, Abraham, Adam, all of the different patriarchs in time. Jesus. And it was way out there from the center of that tree where Jesus was born. Can you imagine that? They have found living trees up there that are 5,000 years old living trees. Some of the dead trees go way back beyond that time. You see these things. There's occupation in these mountains here. The very idea of God proves that he is there. Right straight that way, about 15, 20 miles from here, I took Marilyn there, and I showed a cave to her that had 6,000 years of occupation in it. They traced 6,000 years of occupation. How long has this country been here? Since God divided the earth. There have been people on the American continent since God divided the earth. They didn't get here later. They were here when God divided the earth in the days of Pilate. Let's go back and look at the ontological argument again. The ontological argument as commonly stated this argument finds the very idea of God. The idea of God is the proof of his existence. Because all men have an idea about God. They, they have this Understanding that there must be a God. It holds that all men have intuitively the idea of God and tries to find the proof of his existence in the idea itself. Anselm, what they call in Catholic churches of Saint Anselm, 
was from 1033 to 1109, this Cartes in 1596 to 1650, and Clark in 1675 to 1729 have stated in a different way, none of the statements is in really satisfactory as Anselm's is better than the other two. The monologium, the monologium, he approaches the question of the existence of God from the standpoint of cause and effect. Cause and effect. And the prosolgium, he approaches it from the standpoint of reason. His argument in the later may be stated as follows. We have the idea of an absolute perfect being, but existence is an attribute of perfection. An absolute perfect being must therefore exist. But this is a little more than a logical quibble. Kant says, it is evident from what has been said that the conception of an absolutely necessary being is an, a mere idea, the objective reality of which is far from being established by the mere fact that it is in need of reason. We agree that we cannot deduce real existence from mere abstract thought. The idea of God does not have within itself the proof of existence, the proof of its existence. I want to, I want to bring something here into your understanding. Uh, Marilyn, do you know what mathematics is? Well, there mathematics. Mathematics, there's, there's different kinds of mathematics. Algebra. There is mathematics, and mathematics there is algebra, there is calculus, there is trig, geometry, all of these things. Mm -hmm. Now I want to tell you something. On paper, these are not what we call, uh, these are abstract, abstract. Unless you count out four cookies, and four cookies, and then end up with eight cookies, it's abstract. Unless you got five pieces of yarn and ten pieces of yarn, you have fifteen pieces of yarn, and that's reality in it. Mm -hmm. That's tangible. But all of this other is abstract. Now, the, the real and the abstract. God is, is, in many people's minds, abstract. But in reality, he is tangible. Tangible. But although the ontological argument does not prove the existence of God, it shows that God must be if he exists. Since the cosmological and the teleological arguments have already proved the existence of the personal cause and designer external in the universe, the present argument proves that this being is infinite and perfect, not because of these qualities are demonstrably his, but because our mental constitution will not allow us to think otherwise. When little children are growing up, they think their mother and their daddies are perfect. When they're little. After they get about 12 years old, forget it. The flying saucers have come down and taken their little mind from them. And they won't bring them back for at least another 10, 15, 20 years. They're gone. But they think of their parents as strong and powerful the, the, what we call the typical parent, the parent that takes them to church, the parent that shows them right for wrong and all this stuff, they look upon that parent as if he's God. He's big, he's powerful. He can do all kinds of things, Daddy can and Mama. She can provide all kinds of good food and make sure that we have clean clothes and all of this. this. This is wonderful. Their idea of... Uh, of God. God does provide for us, doesn't he? A parent should imitate God in that he provides and that the child can trust him and look at him as a trustworthy ideal in the abstract sense and yet in the concrete, in the tangible sense also. Or thinks that uh, T.H. That Green has given the best statement of this argument. Green asserts that Thought is a necessary prius of all that is, even all possible and conceivable existence. He declares the re that reason is the source 
of universal and necessary principles which sprang from its existence and that are the conditions of all possible knowledge, but this is, is its own essential nature. Reason finds reflected back from the world around it. The world does exist, constituted to that these very principles which we find within ourselves in space and time through number and quantity, substance and quality, cause and effect, and therefore knowable by us, and capable of becoming an object of our experience, we arrive therefore at this, that the world is constituted through a reason similar to our own. James Orr, The Christian View of God and the World, Grand Rapids, Michigan, 1948, pages 104 to 106. But these universal necessary conditions of all truth and knowledge do not have the ground of their existence in any individual mind. They have their seat and ground in the absolute reason, in the absolute reason, in the absolute Prius of all that is. The moral argument now, the moral argument about God. The ontological argument now, the moral argument. Kant points out that the that theor, that theoretic proofs give us no knowledge of God as a moral being. For this we are dependent upon the practical reason. Upon the practical reason. He held that the fact of obligation and duty was at least as certain as the fact of existence on the basis of conscience and and he argues for freedom and morality and God. For freedom, immorality and immortality and God. The basis of conscience he argues for freedom, immortality and God. The Bible also ap appeals to the moral argument in proof of the existence of God. In Romans 1, 19, 32 and 2, 14 through 16. Strong states this argument in this way. Conscious recognize the existence of a moral law which has supreme authority. Known violations of this moral law are followed by feelings. Ill deserved and fears of judgment. This moral law, since it is not himself imposed, these threats and judgments, since they are not self-executing, representatively argue that the existence of a holy will that has imposed the law of a punitive power that will execute the threats of that moral nature. The will expressed in the moral imperative is superior in two hours, or otherwise it would issue no commands. First of all, there is such a permanent moral law and it has supreme and abiding authority over us. Evolutions do not like to admit this. They like to think of everything as it's in flux, in a flow, in not constant, constantly changing, but that conscience is not self-imposed nor developed from our primitive instincts by our life in society. It is evident from the fact that the sense of duty has no regard to our inclinations, pleasures, or fortunes, nor the practice of society, but it often in conflict with them. We as children of God go and do things that we shouldn't do. We think thoughts that we shouldn't think. We do that. And God condemns our hearts because we know God and God knows us. Yet conscience does not tell us what to do. It merely insists that there is a fundamental moral law in the universe, that it is our duty to observe it. In the second place, known violations of this moral law are followed by feelings of ill, desert, and fears of judgment. David is a good example of this in the Bible in Psalm 32, 3 and 4, 38, 1 through 4. Augustine testifies to the same thing he says thus soul sick was I and tormented accusing myself much much more sorely than my want rolling and turning me in my chain till that we were wholly broken whereby I now was but just but still was held Shakespeare represents the lady Macbeth as haunted by an evil conscience after the murder of King Duncan, even in her sleep. 
We must therefore conclude that this, since this moral law is not self-imposed and these fears of judgment are not, are not self-executing, there is a holy will that imposes this law and, and a punitive power that will execute the threats of our moral nature. Our consciences cry out, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good and what does Jehovah require of you. Micah 6 and verse 8. I might say this, to give you a little further study. I like to throw a little tidbits of information out there to you sometimes. Did you know that many people believe that there was more than one Shakespeare, that Shakespeare himself was not a real man? That they were made up, that Shakespeare's writings were made up of many writings that were collected. Since we quoted Shakespeare a while ago, just a little bit, I thought I might tell you that. God will bring every work into judgment with every hidden thing, whether it good or whether it evil. Ecclesiastes 12 and 14. In other words, conscience recognizes the existence of great lawgiver. God and the certainty of punishment and all violation of his law, the argument from congruity. Now we come down to number five, the argument from congruity. And we're on page 62 of Thiessen's Lectures in Systematic Theology. The argument from congruity. This argument is based on the belief that the postulate which best explains the related facts is probably true. As related to the present discussion, it runs as follows. The belief in the existence of God best explains the facts of our mental, moral, and religious nature as well as the facts of the material universe. Therefore, God exists. It holds that without this postulate, the related facts are really inexplainable inexplicable. Is this a valid argument? Is it a valid argument? We reply that this type of argument has yielded wonderful results in science. Percival Lowell, who has noticed certain variations in the motion of Neptune, he concluded that there must be some large body in that region that caused the variations. Cause and effect. Careful study of that part of the heavens with powerful telescopes in 1932 led to discovery of the heretofore known planet Pluto. The heretofore unknown planet Pluto. That's a little bitty guy. It is the outermost member of the solar system. This pr principle may also be illustrated from the microscope, microscopic world, that is. The particles that make up an atom are not discoverable by direct observation. They are inferred from the effects they produce and the combination, the combinations they enter into. How can you look at an atom? The word is atoma in Greek, atoma. By the way, all scientific and medical terms comes from Greek. All legal terms come from Latin. And I can explain that to you in another way also. The Catholic Church Church history is not church history of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is a monstrosity that evolved out of error. The Catholic Church is a monstrosity that evolved out of error. Out of error. As we look in church history, we see the truth coexisting with error. If there's error, there must be a counterpart which is true. If there's truth, there has to be a counterpart which is error because of Satan himself. We have good and bad. And the reason why we have good and bad is because we have the devil in the, in the universe and we have God in the universe. We have bad people. They're influenced by the devil. We have people that are preachers and missionaries because they're influenced by the person of God. And that is part of the ontological view also. In both our telescopic and microscopic studies, we assume that a postulate which explains or harm, harmonizes the related facts is true. Should we not, in the same principle, conclude that there is a God since the theistic postulate is in harmony with all the facts of our mental, moral, and religious nature? as well as with the facts of the material universe. The material universe calls for a creator. Patton answers this question 
in the infirmity and he says we know that we have the wrong key when it does not fit all the wards of the lock. On the other hand is a strong argument for the truth of theory that it explains that all facts in the case. The belief in a self-existent personal God is in harmony with all the facts of our mental and moral nature as well as with all the phenomena of the material world and all of the phenomena of the supernatural world. You understand that? Mm -hmm. We talk about the spirit world and we talk about the tangible world. The spirit world is real, isn't it? Just as tangible in all reality, just as real as the world that we walk in. If God exists a universe, a universe, a universal belief in his existence is natural enough. The irresistible impulse to ask for the cause, the first cause is accounted for. Our religious nature has an object, a counterpart. The uniformity of natural law finds an adequate explanation of a human hi and human history. It is vindicated from the charge of being immense imposter, imposture. Atheism leaves all of these matters without any explanation. You know, you go to an atheist funeral. The first funeral I ever preached in my life was that of an atheist. He was all dressed up and no place to go for very much in his mind. He was already there in reality. Too late to make any more choices. Atheism leaves all of these matters without any explanation and makes not history alone, but our intellectual nature itself an imposture and a lie. Francis L. Patton, that was quoted from uh, a summary of Christian doctrine. We may conclude, therefore, from this argument also that there is a personal, extra mundane, ethical, and self-revealing God. God has revealed himself to mankind. We're on page 63. God has revealed himself to mankind, and mankind is capable of grasping that revelation. God is capable of revealing himself to man and mankind is capable of grasping and attaining that revelation. We have it in the Bible. We have it in the world. We have it in the cosmos. We have it in, the, in the Pluto. We have it in Neptune. We have it in every night we see Venus. It's there. That planet is there every night. We look at it. And as you look down when we are here in Nevada, here's Venus brightly shining like almost a sun up there. And then down to the left and below is the red planet Mars. It's there. Unless the clouds are so thick, they're there. We can see them with our own eyes. That's tangible evidence that there is a creator out there that put those things in order. When we go up in the mountains up here and we see that rushing water and we see the life of the fish and everything in it, those fish were put there. The first fish was created. The first man was created. The first trees were created. Man can genetically alter animals and plants, but only God can create a tree. Only God can create man. If you're out there today and you're listening to these set of messages and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let him into your world. Allow him to come into your life and change you. Fulfill your life that, in a way that you can never be fulfilled. You'll have a life, abundant life, like you never had before. You'll have a life that has a focus on something besides that tangible world and how much you can make and how much you can store and how much you can do in this world. What we do in this world is left behind, period. What we do for Christ will last forever. I always tell people, go out and do something eternal. You're going to do it whether you think about it or not. Everything we do in this world is eternal. It follows us into eternity future. 
Back in eternity past, on that little map right up here on the wall, we see that God created the heavens and the earth. He created angels. He created spirits. And in his mind, he created man. And he wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life if you're saved. And he created a heaven. He created a paradise. He created two Edens, you know. Those are the throne rooms. Tangible throne rooms on earth before and after the destruction of the earth. The Lord says that in the end times that he's going to create a new heavens and the earth. The world that was, the world that is, and the world that shall become. God does things in threes because he's triune. We'll get on with more of this later. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the studies that we've had to open our minds to your very existence. Father, I pray for those that might not be saved that are out there listening to these messages. That you touch their hearts. Bring them to you. Those that are saved out there, I pray that you, that you encourage them to be holy. Well, that's a big calling, isn't it? Them to be separate from this world and give their lives to you. Let them actually let you be on the throne of their life. Forgive us for your failure, your Father. Forgive me for my shortcomings and my failings in this life. Help me to glorify you with what's left in my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do you have any questions? No, just, uh, just remember from A to Z, God is A, triple A, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it will always be number, I mean letter A yes. in your life. That should be, God should be always the first in our life. Jesus said, I am Alpha and I am Omega, the first and the last. Thank you.